In the, the motion movie, um, oh, was it uh, City Slickers? I almost forgot it there. In that movie, so City Slickers, these three guys decide that you know the old west is where they need to go in order to deal with their lack of completeness, lack of fulfillment, lack of satisfaction. Uh, Mitch Robbins is the main character in the movie. He um, he basically is a 39-year-old advertising salesman who uh, has everything going for him. He has a charming wife. He has beautiful children. They have an apartment on Roosevelt Island. I mean, everything going for him, but he's, for some reason, happiness has gone out of his life like air out of a deflated balloon. And so he had also two other friends that felt the same way. They, they shared his malaise. And so they came up with this idea, this genius idea, that what they needed to do was to join the cattle herders in New Mexico that will lead a you know, herd from New Mexico all the way up to Colorado. Now, to fully understand these people, just to give you a footnote, these guys ran with the bulls in Spain the year before. So it kind of tells you a little bit about them. That they, these guys are three fries short of a Happy Meal probably, but anyway, they think that, that's going to deal with their, their you know, dissatisfaction, their you know, unhappiness. And so they head out to, Mex to New, New Mexico, and they get to this ranch, and this, at that ranch they're met by this old, crusted, uh, crusty, hardened cowboy named Curly. And, uh, you know, he's, they said he was kind of the last of the Marlboro men. Uh, in fact, Robbins characterized him as a kind of an old backpack with eyes. But in any event, this guy was the one that was going to train them in terms of roping and riding and so that they could run with the other guys and, of course, be a part of this cattle herding. Well... Robbins, who again is the main character in this movie, he is kind of enamored with this Curly guy. Curly, who's he doesn't say much. He has this perpetual smile. He's a uh, you know he's tough, hardened, uh, invincible. Never nothing seems to phase him. And so one day, Robbins asked him. He said, "What is your secret? What gives you such confidence?" He said, well, you've got to find the one thing. Now, the problem with that statement is Robbins had no idea what that one thing was. And Curly wasn't talking. And then finally, lo and behold, Curly dies and never tells him what that one thing is. <laughs> that story, in many ways, epitomizes our society and our world. Because it seems like we're so driven to find that one thing that we think is going to give us satisfaction. That's going to give us contentment. It, 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 and that one thing seems to be just beyond reach. As someone said, it's something that fills us with, with a vague sense of discontent. A wanting, to, a wanting for something we can't seem to identify. Mark Twain said, you don't know what it is you want, but it, it, but it just fairly makes your, your heart ache. You want it so much. And that wanting, again, keeps drawing us and wooing us, saying, come on, come on, you can find this. You can find that one thing, and, and you'll be happy and complete and satisfied. The problem is, even when we find that one thing, we're not happy and we're not satisfied. In fact, we're still restless. Psalm 23 is an assault on that deep longing that we often have that we think somehow, we, in fact, we've allowed the world to give us a definition as to what it is. It, it really is an assault on our lack of trust in God for our every need, for whatever that deep longing may be, whatever that deep desire may be. Psalm 23 is an attack, if you will, on that deep longing. Today, we're going to begin a new series on the God of more than enough. Oftentimes, we don't think that God is more than enough. 
And so therefore we're driven. Uh, there was a book once read, uh, written entitled, We Are Driven. And the, the subtitle was, The Obsessive Compulsive Behavior America Loves to Applaud. We're driven to find that one thing that somehow is going to give us satisfaction. But Psalm 23 is an indictment against that very mentality, that very idea. So I want us to turn to Psalm 23, and, and what, as we begin this series, I, I, I want us to avoid one thing. Anyone tell me what that might be? It's contempt. You ever heard the cliche, familiarity breeds what? Contempt. What is contempt? Contempt is that wanting, uh, or I should say, it is uh, not giving the proper honor to someone or something with which you are overly familiar or acquainted. We've read this psalm so many times, it's quoted at every funeral. We've seen it so many places, and so we think we know what it says. We just quote it. And the danger of that, in my opinion, is that we never go below the surface. We never go deeper to see what it means. But this thing is loaded, this whole psalm is loaded with meaning, depth, that we never take into consideration. That God is more than enough, and as we're going to see in the coming weeks, we'll see that God is more than enough to meet your spiritual need. He's more than enough to meet your emotional need. He's more than enough to meet your eternal need. He's more than enough to meet your physical need. But today, the first place we begin is with the question, who is your shepherd? Just who is your shepherd? Now, I, I, I believe that probably every person, hopefully every person that's, come in, that's in here today, has trusted Christ as their Savior. Christ, God, Christ is your Savior. But is he really your shepherd? It's possible that he can be our Savior and yet our never have entered into a, such a, 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 a personal relationship with Christ to the depth that we understand that he is our shepherd as outlined in this passage. So today we're going to ask the question, who is your shepherd? And what I want to do today is I'm going to do something a little bit different in terms of how you approach this. The, the temptation is to read this and go verse by, I mean, word by word and, and to give you the answer uh, give you make a few comments and of course you're thinking I oh, will I've already I knew that I knew that I knew that but today we're going to take different words that ho uh, hopefully will bring you to the point where you can answer that question he is my shepherd or if he's not by the end of the service you'll say I want him to be my shepherd but we're going to start with the last word in the verse one the word want. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not what? Want. Now, does he mean that as a child of God that I will not lack material things or I will not lack physical things? I mean, there are those out there who would say that, right? There are those out there who preach that. But is that really what he's saying here? Uh, the, David, who wrote this, certainly knew of privation. He knew of the, of the Spirit's angst. He knew what it was to not have much. He didn't have a lot of physical things. So, in fact, he was physically, he was harassed by King Saul and all his forces numerous times. So he didn't have the, all the material and the physical. So the word want here has a, apparently has a much broader meaning than just physical or material things. Certainly the basic concept is that of not lacking, not being deficient in terms of proper care and oversight, and we'll get more in the, in, into that later. But also in a secondary emphasis of this word would be that we are content. We are content in God's care of us. 
That we know that he's watching over us. We know that he's walking beside us. And because of that, we are content in his care. See, in David's mind, he had arrived at the place in which discontent came to die. So the basic teaching here that apparently David had concluded was that I won't lack, no one will lack in terms of God's care over them. God will be with me. I shall not lack when it comes to the expert care and compassion of God who walks beside me. Paraclete is a Greek word that's often used. It means to walk alongside. And it has the idea of God just walking beside us. Well, the shepherd leads us and he cares for his sheep. He watches over his sheep. There's a great story uh, that's told about the Allied soldiers that after World War II, they collected, went around and collected a lot of children that were homeless. And they put them in this large camp and they fed them well. But they discovered that there's a problem with these, these children in terms of sleeping at night. They couldn't sleep at night. And so one psychologist came up with a great idea. They gave, they put in each child's hand one piece of bread. Now they told them, if you want more to eat, you can, we'll give you more to eat. But you cannot eat this piece of bread. You are to sleep with this piece of bread. They said it had a marvelous result. You see, those children knew by sleeping with that piece of bread that they would have something to eat in the morning. They were so used to going to bed at night, fearful that they would, they'd wake up in the morning without anything to eat. When David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that's like, that, like bread in your hand, if you will, saying, listen, God is going to take care of you. He's going to watch over you. You're going to have the expert's care and compassion and oversight over you. So now, the wise Bible student would look at this and say, okay, it says you shall not want. So it's the last statement in this verse. So apparently I need to go back and see why is it that I shall not want? Why is it that I shall not lack in terms of of this well and that's where we come to the word Lord now what is this word Lord it's a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah now that's the most loftiest most sacred word name of God that the Jews ever used in fact it was known that if the Jew had to read that in a public reading of Scripture, if it was in part of the, the context of the passage, that they would not read that word, that name. They would substitute a lesser name for God than that name because they thought it was so sacred. In fact, they wouldn't even write the total name out. They would only write the consonants. And this really goes back to... to, to, to uh, Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, it speaks of, um, of when, where God came to Moses and said, Moses, I've got something for you to do. And Moses realized that what he had for him to do was so much, so big that it was too big for him to handle. And so he said, well, what am I, what am I to tell the people uh, who sent me? Who am I to tell the people that, that, that sent me? And so he said, well, tell them in chapter, in Exodus chapter uh, 3, verse 14, it says, uh, God said to Moses, tell them I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say, the son of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. I am that I am. Now, what does that mean? I am that I am. That speaks of the fact that God is a preexistent God. He's saying, I am, I exist now. I always existed, always have existed. It speaks of the fact that he is, as God, there's, there was never a beginning, there was never an ending. And obviously, there never will be an ending to God. That he is 
is it, he is and he is to come. He was, he is, and he is to come. He, was, he is one God. Now, that can only have a cold comfort to us unless we understand this connected to something else. You see, we can see them as this, this uh, great, mighty God, a, a self-existent God, but if we don't connect the dots, then we're going to miss the personal aspect, how it relates to us. You see, if he is self-existent, he is also self-sufficient. What do I mean by that? I mean that there's nothing that God has to have from anybody else or from anything else in order to make him God. When I'm cold, I need a coat. When I'm hungry, I need food. When I'm sick, I need a doctor. Same with all of us. God doesn't need anything outside of himself to be God. And what that means in a practical sense is that God has what no one in creation has. He is eternally, he has this eternally unchangeable nature. That all the resources that anyone or anything could ever need are found in God. And thus, the implication of that is that he also has everything there is in terms of our need. He is not only self-sufficient, he is all-sufficient for each of us. Now, Jesus comes along and he connects the dots. In the Old Testament, you have the I am. I am who I am, or I am that I am. And again, that could be just of cold comfort. But Jesus comes along and he says, look, let me show you how this relates to us. There are seven I am's in the book of John, actually eight. But there are seven I am's in the book of John. In John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. In chapter 8, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, I am the door. In chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, I am the true vine. But in chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. I am. What does he mean, I am? Well, in the original Greek text, you just... In English, you see just I am. But in the original Greek text, it is I, I am. Ego emi. Which is a, basically an emphatic statement. But it also connects Jesus to the God of the I am in the Old Testament. And so here we have this God who is all sufficient, who is everything that anyone could ever need. And he says... Because I, Jesus says, because I am the all-sufficient one, I'm good enough and I'm sufficient enough to be the bread of life for you. I'm sufficient enough to be, to be your light of the world. I'm sufficient enough to be the door for eternal life. I'm sufficient enough to be your resurrection in life. I'm sufficient enough to be the way, the truth, and life. In other words, you get the idea. I'm sufficient enough to be your shepherd, your good shepherd. So that's what he means when he says, the Lord is. Not just that he's a ma our master, but that he is God, the all-sufficient one. Now the next word is the word shepherd. Now shepherd is a modest metaphor, really, but it is just pregnant, if you will, with meaning. Uh, David one day probably was standing out watching his sheep and he probably thought about the incessant care that sheep required. He thought perhaps of their restlessness and their discontent. He probably recalled their foolish straying from, from safe paths, their constant need for guidance, and probably the, the time and the patience that were needed to shepherd them, to watch over them. He probably pondered the fact that he, as a shepherd, 
must think for his sheep. He must guard his sheep. He must, again, watch over them. All these things. He's thinking all these things, and then he comes to this conclusion. God is my shepherd, because that's what God does for me. That's what God does for us. He probably remembered the bruises and the scratches that he had to take care of, to treat, and to bound. And, and, and how often he, he had to rescue them from danger. And, and he thought, you know, these, these sheep have no clue as to the care, the oversight that's given to them. They're just sheep. He thought, that's what God does for us. Ancient shepherds knew their sheep by name. They were well acquainted with all their ways, their, their characteristics, their idiosyncrasies, their uh, you know, peculiarities. And, and David had to think, that's exactly what God does for us. He knows of our tiresome stories. He knows of, of our the sin in our heart. He knows of our heartbreak and the deep things that are so deep. So He knows the scars and the mars of our heart and our soul. Things that are so deep that we wouldn't share with anyone, even our closest friend. And even while other people are put off by our disposition or by our ways, God is, is never put off by that. Back then, the sh shepherd did not drive the sheep from behind as the western shepherd does. But no, he led them. In fact, he, once he called their name, they followed him. There's an example of one. And when the shepherd, sometimes shepherds would combine their sheep, their flock together at night in a, in a sheepfold out in the wilderness, in the desert. But the next day when they called their sheep, each one followed the right shepherd. They knew exactly who to follow. And David thought of that, that God knows our name. He calls us by name, and we follow him. The, his presence was the, their assurance. In fact, the good shepherd would give his life to protect his sheep. At night in the sheepfold, when they were in this huge thing, this round thing at night, he would lie across the door or the opening of the sheepfold to keep out wild animals and, and if, he, if need be, to confront them and fight them. David in 1 Samuel 17 said, When a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by, watch this, by his beard and struck him and killed him. <laughs> wow. See, throughout the day, the shepherd watched over his sheep, giving them constant care. He never left them. And if he did leave them, he only left them for a short while when one would stray away. And so... In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, that we know is the, the passage that speaks of the Great Commission. But did you think about the last part of that Great Commission? It says, And lo, I am what? With you always. What David was trying to say is that God is a full service shepherd. So what are you talking about? Used to be a number of years ago, occasionally you can see these today, but not very often. Used to be when you pulled into the service station, you got full service. That meant that when people would come out of, from, you know, the station, be a couple of guys, and they would take your credit card, they would put gas in your car, they would, of course, do your windshield, they would check your tires, they would check your oil, check your water, uh, you know, just about everything you wanted done, they would do it. That was called full service. Now today, we go to a service station, and what do we do? We have to serve ourselves, don't we? We have to get out if it's raining. We have to get out, and we get wet sometimes. We, we have to get out and get dirty, get gas on our hands. But that there was a time when all you had to do is just pull into a service station. My father-in-law, in fact, owned a service station and, um, uh, and did quite well there. And, uh, and when I would refer to it as a gas station, he said, no, it's not a gas station. 
It's a service station. Well, our shepherd, God, is a full service shepherd. That is, there's all, he has everything we would need. See, when you pulled in that service station, there would be guys there who wanted to meet every need that your automobile might have. They were going to tell you everything was wrong with it, everything that needed to be done, and provi provide you with an opportunity to take care of it. That's what David was saying here. That God is a full service shepherd. Now the reason so many people today can't pray, Lord, the Lord is my shepherd, is because they're living their life as self-service. They're living a self-served life. They're, they're saying, you know, I, something comes up and they say, you know, I, I need to take care of this. I'm going to reverse this. I'm going to take charge of this. I'm on this. I'm on top of this. And what do we do? We end up becoming dirty and tired and sweaty and whatever and frustrated. But God's a full service shepherd. Then the next word is a word, simple verb, is. Don't over or underestimate the potency of this word. He didn't say the Lord was my shepherd. He didn't say the Lord will be my shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd right now, in this very moment. It's a, it's a present tense relationship, and it has to be. Why? Because of God's name. What is God's name? I am. I am. Which means I am your God right now. God can't say, I'll be with you tomorrow. He can say, I'll be in your tomorrow. Because there is no past tense with God. There is no future tense with God. You say, what do you mean? Let's suppose that the top of this pulpit from here going from your left to right let's say this is the beginning of time okay the the earth began right here and this is the end okay now you're here or you're here or here and you can say tomorrow I will do this or next week I'll do this but you see God's not subject to space or confined to space and time. You see, God is like this room and more. God's already in tomorrow. He's already. You say, wow, that's deep. But it's the truth. So he's not confined to space and time. So why is this important? It's important because... When you have a need, a struggle, or a hurt, you don't say, well, I'm going to be hurting tomorrow, or I'm going to be struggling tomorrow. I need God tomorrow. No. Your struggle, your hurt, your need will be now. And God says, I am now. I am the, I, I am the now God, the now shepherd. I meet you at the point of where you are now. So many live their lives with anxiety. Fearing tomorrow. But the reason they do that is that they don't wait upon the shepherd. They don't realize that God is a, the shepherd right now. I mean, you drive, let's go back to the full service idea. You drive into a service station. You're not going to hear somebody say, well, hey, we can't take care of you today. Come back tomorrow. We don't have any gas. We don't have enough help. Blah, 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 blah. When the people journeyed in the wilderness, God gave them cornflakes or Wheaties, whatever, something, it was, they called it manna, but it was a lot like that. It was pretty bland. But he would give them manna each day. Enough for just that day. Except on the sixth day, he would give them enough for two days. For the Sabbath. But he, just, he would give them just enough. He didn't give them more than enough. He didn't give them less than enough, but he gave them just enough. Why? 
Because he wanted them to see and come to a place of dependence where they were totally dependent upon him each day. If he'd given them a week in advance or given them two weeks in advance or a month in advancement, they would not need God until the food ran out. And God says, hey, I'm your shepherd right now. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let me take care of tomorrow. Just let me sh- minister to you and shepherd you today. So God, just like with the, the people of Israel, God wants us to know that he will meet our need today, but he won't meet tomorrow's need today. Just what we're facing today. In Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 12 it says as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day in the day when he is among his scattered sheep so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day the Lord is my shepherd well here's the last the pronoun my it wasn't enough for David to say the Lord is a shepherd it wasn't enough for, the Lord, for David to say the Lord is the shepherd. No, he had to say the Lord is my shepherd. Christ came to earth, went to the cross, died for our sins, did away, set us free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but he also broke down that barrier between God and man so that God can have fellowship with man. God desires to have fellowship with man more than man desires it with God. Sometimes we kind of hear about God being our shepherd and we say, well, I'm not sure I want that. I'm not sure I really, you know, that's good and nice and it's good for, you know, it's a poetic statement, great poetic statement, but I'm not sure I want him to control my life and be a part of my life. You know, when you go to a a restaurant, they'll give you a pager if if the restaurant is full. They'll give you a pager. They'll take your name. They'll give you a pager. And if you're patient enough, that pager will vibrate and they'll call you by your name and say, here's your table. Now, if you're impatient, you say, I've been waiting too long, you leave, then, then you've lost that, right? Well, so many people wonder why their life, their spiritual life is lifeless, that it doesn't vibrate with life. And the reason is, is that they they won't wait long enough for God's pager to go off so that the shepherd can give them instruction or meet that particular need. Psalm 95 verse 7 says, For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today if you will hear his voice. You notice that? Today if you will hear his voice. Shortly after we got married, um, I bought Debbie a a cashmere sweater. Spent all my money. Uh, for the sweater and um, but this sweater was not a sweater that you could buy off the rack and here's why because it had it was monogrammed and it had D with a big M and then an S M for Morgan S for her maiden name D for Debbie now I was real proud of that sweater for a couple reasons number one because she liked it Number two, because it had DMS, DSM is how it would go. In other words, it it said, listen, this is my bride. This is my, my girl. She belongs to me. I've got this special relationship with her. A lot of people want an off the rack God. They don't want a monogram relationship. You see, the Word of God tells us that our initials have been initialed into God's heart. But he wants us to have his son's initial on our heart. And listen, it, 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 it doesn't matter 
about our sin, in terms of our sin, because so often we look and we say, well, I, how can he love me and how can he want me? But remember, he is a, a God who not only is self-existent, but he is eternal love. He doesn't emit love, he is love. He can't be more love than he already is. George MacDonald said it this way, God's love surrounds us seeking the smallest crack by which it may rush in. Seeking the smallest crack by which it may rush in. You ever try to keep water out? Hmm. See, we, we're not where he may want us to be, but we're not unwanted. And this, what David is saying is if you will allow him, he will be your shepherd. He will be that shepherd in whatever need, or whatever struggle, whatever hurt, whatever dilemma that you find yourself in this moment, this day, or tomorrow. He is that shepherd who desires to walk beside you, to, in fact, who desires to lead you either through that, whatever that is, or around that, or out of it. Two application questions. For what have you not trusted the shepherd? For what have you not trusted the shepherd? What is it right now in your life that you haven't trusted him? Given over to him? And secondly, this, the, the second question may, I mean the answer to the second question may be the same as the first. What is the deepest longing of your heart that needs the shepherd's care? What's the deepest longing of your heart right now? And maybe it's the same thing you haven't trusted him for. But maybe that you know that you've, there's something you haven't you know, turned over to him. You may know of that. But there also may be something, a deep longing. Something deep down inside. Maybe it's a, a, a deep scar, a pain, hurt that you haven't thought about. You just know it's there. And you haven't thought about connecting that deep hurt, that pain, whatever it might be, with the shepherd. 